Okay. Can you hear me? Can yes, you yes, yes. See the yes. presentation? Yes. And okay, pointer, excellent. pointer. Yes, great. All right, super. Well, thanks to, to Sergey, the, the stage is set. Uh, so uh, we, we, we just heard that uh, there are fantastic tools now available uh, that allow us to, to measure all, all, all degrees of freedom in, in strongly correlated materials. These are, of course, electron spins, but also lattice degrees of freedom. Um, so I'll, I'll try and uh, not go into too many technical details about these methods. Uh, but focus a little bit more um, on hopefully provocative questions for theory. <laughs> uh, but also I would like to stress that it's important uh, to have the right uh, uh, driving pulses. So what's, what's, what's shown down here is uh, schematically what we want to do. So we wanted to change the coupling between these degrees of freedom by properly shaped laser pulses. Um, and uh, that is, uh, of course, similar to the, to the probes, uh, to a large degree uh, dependent on the av available technology. Uh, but um, I hope I, I can show that, uh, that we have now some, some tools at hand uh, to, to tailor the pulses to, to the um, questions that we actually want to, to answer. And, uh, what we, what we would like to get out is, of course, we want to control the, the electronic and spin motion in these functional materials. And when we say control, that means, uh, or that implies usually also some, some sort of applications that, uh, that we should have in mind. And uh, two kinds of applications are highlighted here uh, on, the, on the right hand side. So this is a switching of, of, mag, mag, of the magnetic order by light. And of course, uh, you, you already know that uh, there are some hopes to maybe make use of this in, in data storage applications. On the left here, this is uh, changing the metallic, metallic or insulating state of, of the materials. And that has uh, possible uh, applications in, in information technology maybe also. Um, so here, this is uh, magnetic switching by light. This is the so-called all optical switching that was discovered uh, by Theo Rasing and his group uh, a, a few, you know, not, not just years, almost a, a decade or, or, or more back. And um, if one wants to, to utilize this for some applications, of course, uh, you don't want to switch a, a macroscopic piece of a material but you may, might, might want to try and switch a, a, a future bit in a, in a data storage device. So what we've done here is we used a little plasmonic antennas that are shown here in, um, in black that were put by lithography onto this uh, magnetic material, this uh, trans transition metal rare earth alloy. And this uh, focused uh, the, the laser, laser pulses down to uh, dimensions of of, of bits. And then uh, one laser pulse uh, could switch uh, the bit from the, the blue magnetization to the red magnetization and the subsequent uh, laser pulse can switch the bit back. So this is actually a very nice uh, demonstration. And uh, the imaging was done with, with x-rays uh, that are magnetic sensitivity, uh, that gain magnetic sensitivity through XMCD, of course. Um, now, of course, uh, in future applications, uh, one doesn't want to do this with light, but there is developments now also uh, that this switching can be done with electronic pulses. So these are very interesting experiments and they, they do keep applications in mind. Uh, but of course, the switching mechanism is uh, still, uh, there needs to be a, a lot, lot explored and even more so, uh, in this case, where one wants to switch the laters uh, to a metallic state and, and also going back. Um, and this was demonstrated here for tantalum uh, disulfide by uh, Drakan Mikhailovic and his group. And they started in an insulating state where the uh, uh, charge density wave order could be changed with a, with a very short laser pulse and a conducting state could, could be introduced uh, that actually was was unavailable in a, 
uh, was is, is not accessible in equilibrium. So there is a non-equilibrium pathway that brings this material uh, into the conducting state. And uh, the idea there, of course, is that the lattice plays a role uh, to lock this uh, new me metallic order uh, into a metastable state, and that's schematically <laughs> illustrated up here. And how this happens is, I think, uh, it's fair to say this is, is unknown at the moment. Uh, and there, this path from the left to the right is, is non-equilibrium, but of course, when con when one can go back uh, through an equilibrium pathway by having simply longer pulses. Uh, so again, there is very much uh, interest in, in keeping uh, applications, technological applications in mind. So what I want to do in the following, I'll focus on, on magnetism. Uh, I'll give a few, uh, di discuss a few experiments that highlights what's going on uh, and what is of, might, might be of interest, and then give an outlook uh, uh, on the first steps to actually control the interactions in correlated materials with light. Okay, so ultrafast magnetism is a, is, a, is a field that is actually quite old now, and it started with this uh, pioneering paper by by the Strasbourg group that uh, found uh, demagnetization following a laser excitation on a very, very fast sub picosecond time scale. Um, and of course, that has triggered a new field. Um, what, I, what I show in the title, the problem so far is that uh, this was usually uh, in, in, induced by the commercially available uh, laser, laser pulses which drives drive the system into a very highly non-equilibrium state that is shown over here, for instance. Um, so we, we, we measured this uh, using time-resolved photoemission, where you can actually measure the temperature of electrons by the uh, broadening of the, the Fermi Dirac distribution. And if this is a Fermi Dirac distribution, one can assign a temperature. Uh, so these are the, the, the red data points, but you can also see that there's purple data points so at early times, there is no temperature because there's no Fermi Dirac distribution. And then one can, the best one can do is assign a mean energy to the excited electrons. And in equilibrium, this would, uh, would then converge to a temperature. So this illustrates that uh, we have a problem describing this system because the best that people do nowadays is uh, the so-called three temperature model, assign a temperature to a non-equilibrium state uh, which is, of course, uh, a little bit problematic. And uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of investigations have actually then uh, focused on uh, how to describe this in a phenomenological three temperature model or extend it. And there are some ideas now, or basically the standard model developed by Bert Koopmans describes the, uh, in, within this model uh, the disappearance of the spin angular momentum, and it's uh, believed that uh, it will, will end up in the phonon system. Um, but of course, the question is, do we really have to, to do this problematic excitation? So I would like to, to, to outline an experiment that we did a few years ago, ago to see whether we can actually measure uh, not just uh, how the whole ensemble uh, relaxes from a very strongly non-equilibrium state to an equilibrium state, but kind of try and uh, identify the individual scattering processes that dissipate the, the spin angular momentum out of a ferromagnet. So we don't want to do uh, this uh, highly exciting interband excitation uh, with optical pulses, but we would like to go to a to a kind of softer excitation you, using terahertz pulses, and they excite uh, in the intraband excitations. So in a metal terahertz pulses, they drive spin currents in ferromagnet ferromagnetic materials. So that was the idea. Uh, can we learn something about uh, the, the scattering processes uh, from such an excitation? And of course, what can be done is uh, one, one simply measures the terahertz conductivity. So the transmitted radiation can be analyzed in amplitude and phase, and one can uh, um, then e very easily uh, plot the, uh, um, the, the complex conductivity that is measured. 
uh, describing it with a Drude model, with an extended Drude model, uh, one can see, I'm not going to go into details, that this is actually uh, uh, described best in this amorphous material, cobalt iron boron, by uh, scattering uh, from, from uh, lattice defects. Uh, but one also can get a scattering time out, which is in this case 30 femtoseconds. Uh, so this is very nice. So the next step uh, is we would like to, to use this pulse now to drive uh, a spin current and look at how this influences the magnetization. And this is uh, shown here. Uh, so the, the influence on the magnetization shown, shown here can be twofold. One, of course, the magnetic part of the the, the terahertz field can uh, uh, act as a, as a can in, induce a torque, and one can measure this uh, through, uh, yeah, through a, a time delayed uh, probe pulse, which is in this case using the optical magneto optical Kerr effect. One can measure, can measure the, the the precession of the magnetization, and this is actually a, a nice way to to measure uh, the, the the line shape of the terahertz field. Um, one can also measure the energy dissipation that is, uh, is happening through driving an, um, a current essentially via the electric field. Um, and this is shown, shown down here. Uh, so we can see actually a, a demagnetization due to this deposited energy. And this happens to, so this over here is of course linear in the driving field, whereas this happens to be quadratic uh, through the energy dissipation, right? It's just the current times the electric field. And uh, that's, that's shown in, in the inset. So the key now is that we can describe this, we can model the, the, this uh, uh, dissipation, this demagnetization through energy dissipation uh, by the known uh, driving field. That's the, uh, the solid line here. And this is a very nice fit, it's parameter free. Uh, and it means, because the field inside the material is actually broadened compared to the outside material by our scattering time, we can actually see that this demagnetization or deduce from this, that the demagnetization is happening through individual scattering events of, the, of a duration around 30 femtoseconds. So that way, uh, this is actually the first indication, I think, that the, that, uh, um, the dissipation of, of, of spin angular momentum to the to, to, to the sink to the lattice most likely happens very fast and uh, yeah I would uh, call this uh, as a first challenge to really explain or, or, or figure out the microscopic mechanism and this is is clearly uh, still missing uh, so how does actually uh, not just uh, energy uh, dis dissipation to, to, to the lattice happens but also the angular momentum dissipation Okay, um, so let me outline uh, a few more experiments. So this, is, uh, this was a probe of the uh, magnetic order parameter um, being modified by a terahertz driving field. But of course, if you flip a spin, uh, then this will uh, excite magnon spin waves as well. Uh, if you transfer energy to the lattice, uh, phonons will be excited. So the, the question now is, uh, how do we probe these, these quasiparticles? particles? Uh, so how do we probe uh, phonon excitations and spin waves in the time domain? And uh, how do we figure out what, what, what is their transient occupation or how, 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 how do they behave? And the idea here is that we need to perform quasi-elastic scattering. So we have our quasiparticle particle here. It's given, of course, by momentum and an energy. And uh, so the momentum we, we measure via the transferred wave vector in a scattering process. And if we uh, drive the system such that uh, all, all the phonons or the, or the magnons are coherently excited, then we can measure the energy through the Fourier transform of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, the beating in the time domain. And this uh, we would like to do for phonons and ultimately also for, for magnons. So the phonons will in this case be excited since we heat the uh, electronic system. So they are excited through electron-phonon coupling. And fortunately, typically for, for phonons, 
the lattice anharmonicity is small, so we can expect to follow a lot of beating in the time domain. And it turns out this will be a little bit more complicated for spin waves here. We, we have to flip spins through demagnetization and that uh, on, a, on a certain time scale also then uh, is, is hopefully exciting spin waves. And there it turns out uh, that they are actually, especially when we demagnetize a lot, um, this is a, is a highly nonlinear process. Uh, so there, there will be some interesting uh, consequences coming from that. So let me briefly go and uh, look into phonons. Uh, since we've done, or other, also other people have done uh, quite a few measurements there, I'll go mainly uh, into a bit more detail for the phonon, uh, for probing transient phonons, and just give a brief on outline uh, for, for magnons. Okay, so um, as an experimental detail, we, we probe phonons by having a, a, a probe that has uh, uh, the sensitivity or has a wavelength to, to measure the lattice spacing in the material. So we, know, we need to use hard X-rays or we need to use electrons. So hard X-ray pulses or electron pulses, uh, they can do a similarly good or bad job. And uh, for a static lattice, uh, for a perfect lattice, we of course get sharp rack peaks. Whereas if we have phonons excited, um, then uh, we get diffuse scatter around these rack peaks. This is actually a measurement uh, using electrons. So that means the electron uh, wavelength is so small that we can get uh, quite, a, quite a few of these rack peaks on the, on, the, on, the, on the CCD screen. Their intensity is blocked here. Uh, so that the uh, very small diffuse scatter, which is orders of magnitude la uh, smaller than the, uh, the Bragg intensity is actually visible. So that, that's uh, uh, clearly visible. And the, the intensity of the diffuse scatter um, is then proportional or given by the phonon occupation and the separation from the Bragg peak is the phonon wave vector. So it's, uh, it's actually that, that simple, the measurement. Let me go into a, a few examples. Um, so let's look at, um, yeah, so the question is how do we, how do we excite uh, these, these phonon wave packets uh, coherently? And in that case, uh, so this has been done uh, in, in bulk semiconductors by David Rees and Mariano Trigo in Stanford using a, a excitation of, uh, of two phonons, so phonons, phonon squeezing. Uh, through optical excitation. But we want, want to look at thin films. Um, and in this case, it turns out that uh, the way to excite coherent phonons is through the transient lattice expansion of, of a thin iron film, for instance, shown here on an uh, MGO substrate. So top here, here is shown the deposited laser energy, which is higher at the surface compared to the, to the bulk of the film. And this means there is uh, energy transferred to, to the lattice vibrations, uh, and then the, the crystal wants to expand. And this expansion means there's strain waves moving from the, this interface inward, and to a lesser degree also from this, from this interface, since it's colder, into the center of the film. And these strain waves, this, these are coherent phonon wave packets that can be uh, measured through this diffuse scatter. And depending, uh, on how far away from the Bragg peak uh, we are, we measure different uh, beating frequencies as shown here uh, to the left. So here, a technical detail, we've chosen this Bragg peak and uh, taken care of that the, uh, the wave vector probe that is probed is always uh, along the surface normal. And then you can clearly see that different uh, vibration oscillations happen for different wave vectors. If one does the Fourier transform, uh, one follows the uh, dispersion of the longitudinal ac acoustic phonon branch. So this is all very nice. So what I find exciting is uh, one can now quantitatively uh, fit these oscillation amplitudes. If one just takes uh, electron phonon coupling in a uh, n, n temperature model into account, uh, that is the, the blue data here, uh, there is not, not a very good agreement. So there is something else happening. And this, what, this else that is happening is that 
The electronic system is also very highly excited in this case, since we, we whack it with a very intense laser pulse. And this uh, excited electronic system can also ex exert a pressure uh, onto, onto the, the strain waves that are excited. So if you take this into account in red, then uh, we get a very good fit. So what, what this means is the, the analogy is probably uh, closer to what's happening in, in semiconductors. If one excites them, I think it's commonly accepted that uh, the excitation can change the bonding between atoms. And that causes, uh, of course, uh, um, an impulsive excitation of, of phonons. So something similar seems to happen. And this can actually be uh, uh, modeled very, very, very nicely. Uh, so Peter Oppenier and this group have, have modeled that um, an isotropic electronic stress can be included here uh, that is necessary to explain these experiments. So by using the, uh, the lattice as a, as a probe, so to speak, one can figure out that there is a, a highly excited electronic system that uh, we need to actually uh, describe better. So in this case, this highly excited electronic system, globally speaking, changes the electronic bonding and exerts a, a, an impulsive pressure to, 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 the, to the strain waves that are launched. Okay. So these are phonons that are polarized along the, uh, the propagation direction. So these are longitudinal uh, acoustic phonons. Uh, interestingly, a few years after our experiment, Steve Johnson and, and colleagues, they have found that uh, this strain wave also contains not just the, the longitudinal phonons, but also transverse phonons. So they, uh, they together, um, if one uh, looks at the phase, uh, they indicate that the atoms in, in a magnetic material uh, go around in little circles. So this is actually very exciting since it's the, the first indication that the lattice actually, by doing this circular motion, can take up angular momentum. So the conclusion here was that uh, this is the equivalent of the einstein de Haas effect on a femtosecond time scale. So we all know that a suspended magnet if one changes the magnetization direction, starts to rotate. So the idea here would be that uh, this is actually um, um, yeah, an indication that this is happening on a very fast time scale. Uh, but you can see here, of course, uh, this is barely, barely outside the noise. So interestingly, uh, in our experiment, we looked for, for the same effect, but we were too impatient and uh, it, it wasn't, wasn't outside the noise. So Steve and, and, and colleagues, they just uh, measured much, 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 much longer. Uh, and then you can see here, uh, there, there seems to be an effect. So of course, this needs to be uh, pinned down, corroborated for other materials. Uh, and then again, uh, this is uh, actually uh, an interesting question for theory to address. So if this is all true, then there should be also not just an electronic pressure, uh, in this high, highly non-equilibrium state that drives strain waves or drives lattice, lattice motion, but there must also be a magnetic pressure. So we are at the moment uh, looking for, for this, uh, uh, the indication for a magnetic pressure in other systems. And um, I'm going to show you an example um, for iron platinum. So iron platinum, um, has a, is a material that has very strong spin-orbit coupling and is, uh, is one of the materials of, of, of choice for the next generation of hard disk drives uh, where it's uh, in uh, little uh, clusters in granular form um, providing the, the magnetic anisotropy to keep uh, very small bits uh, aligned. Um, so that means because it's uh, of use for, for magnetic data storage. There is worldwide quite a bit of growing really nice uh, um, clusters here. This is a TEM image and you can see how well aligned the atom positions are. You can actually also see the facets uh, between one grain and the next. So the black stuff is amorphous carbon that acts as a glue between the two. Uh, so very good, very good materials are available. Um, so we thought, Let's look at this, these, these materials and see what happens if we 
uh, yeah, drive uh, a system with a very strong spin orbit coupling into a non equilibrium state? Do we find evidence for magnetic pressure? And this is a, a ground state calculation from, from, from Peter and company um, that uh, use a ferromagnetic ground state and a paramagnetic ground state. And it kind of, kind of indicates that the uh, uh, C over A ratio for the for this lattice, so C and and A is shown here, um, is very different for the two uh, magnetic uh, magnetic states. So the question now would be, if we if we demagnetize uh, such a system, so we we go from this uh, surface from this potential surface to this potential surface uh, very fast. Uh, does actually the system start to relax and go, go then towards its, uh, its minimum in the paramagnetic uh, state? If this is the case, then we can use this as a, we can use the lattice motion after the excitation to, to find out something um, about the condition during laser excitation. For instance, the motion from uh, this C over A ratio to this, would indicate, because it has to happen in a certain direction in phase space, would indicate whether there is actually indeed a, a, some sort of magnetic pressure happening. Okay, so the, the measurement is actually fairly straightforward uh, and it's based on, this is again a technical detail, since these materials, they are grown epitaxially on a, on a certain, on a substrate, all these, uh, these clusters have their lattices aligned the same direction. So that means we don't need a mi microscopy. We can just illuminate uh, with, a, with, a, with a lattice probe and figure out how the lattice mo moves. And that's shown here. So we don't uh, really have to look at individual clusters. We can just illuminate the whole material and see as a function of uh, time after the pump, how the uh, uh, the c axis so that's the uh, the direction perpendicular to the uh, to the platinum and iron layers and the uh, ab direction which is the parallel direction changes so this is simply by selecting the the proper break, break peaks and see how how the lattice constants the respective lattice constants change so we start uh, uh, at this point so that's uh, uh, zero picoseconds uh, when the, uh, the pumping happens at the same time as the probing. And then the system for the first three picoseconds moves along this path. Then it changes uh, direction and it moves back there, uh, starts to oscillate a little bit and settles uh, towards the equilibrium which is shown in purple here. Okay, and this first uh, three picosecond uh, motion, this is now actually kind of indicative because it's uh, going in this direction uh, that uh, the C over A ratio changes uh, from a large to a small value. So if, if this motion was determined by electronic pressure, we know from the previous measurement that this would be an isotropic lattice, uh, lattice change. So that means the system would have to, to move along this direction, right? So the C axis has to expand and the AB axis has to expand. So this is clearly not the case. So we think this is, uh, is indeed now um, a nice uh, illustration that the system through, through the change of the magnetic order parameter, one can measure the demagnetization in a, sep in a, in a separate experiment. So this is the fastest change, um, sets the time scale. It happens uh, within a few hundred femtoseconds. That launches the system along this path and the direction of this path indicates that it's a magnetic driving force. So this is an experimentalist view, um, as you can imagine, or maybe not, uh, the, the theory description behind uh, such a motion is, uh, is not available at the moment. So it would really be, uh, be good to figure out together what kind of new experiments we should do or uh, can you actually uh, model what, what we've seen here, right? Um, so this would be a, a very interesting discussion that we could have within this, uh, this project. Okay, so let me show you one slide about spin waves. 
Um, of course, the measurement will be the same. We measure the diffuse scatter uh, with magnetic sensitivity. And the magnetic sensitivity is uh, provided by X-ray magnetic circular die crystals. So we tune into an absorption edge. For iron, it's the, uh, the L edge. Uh, for, for gadolinium, it's the M edge. And then in this case, we looked at this material that shows all optical switching, but this is a technical detail. So the, the, the scattering geometry is uh, very straightforward and we simply measure the diffuse scatter away from this uh, uh, straight through beam. And uh, in this illustration, uh, yeah, the, the illustration indicates that there is changes in this radial distribution of the intensity versus uh, time delay after, after the laser excitation. And that's uh, summarized here. So let me not go into too many technical details. Uh, so what's shown here is actually um, an atomistic uh, uh, spin uh, calculation by the York group um, that shows um, what's going on in real space. And of course the Fourier uh, transform of this uh, corresponds to, to what we pick up uh, in, in reciprocal space with scattering. So this is all, um, explained in this rather lengthy paper here. And you can see here, uh, or what, what, is, what is noteworthy is that after the demagnetized state, there are spin fluctuations or magnons at all different wave vectors or at all length scales. And then there is this uh, uh, condensation or this formation of these uh, magnetic uh, droplet-like features. Uh, these are transient, so these are not magnetic domains. They disappear on longer time scales. And this is actually uh, the new thing that is happening here. Uh, so what, uh, what is interesting, at least what was interesting to me, is the nonlinear lambda lipschitz gilbert equation means that uh, in this case, there is, it leads to an attractive interaction between magnons. So they actually try to condense in the, into these magnetic drops, into these droplets that are transient features and they live for a certain while and then they, they, they decay again. And of course, uh, uh, if one thinks now in terms of uh, having materials with, uh, with, with a certain topology, this can actually also pick up some, uh, uh, some windedness and uh, there can be uh, skirmions formed. So there's actually lots of interesting uh, uh, extensions of, of this, this work possible. Okay, but ag again, I thought I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, I'll just give a, a brief outlook. I hope I still have some time. I'll give a brief outlook um, on- Five uh, minutes. Sorry? Five minutes. Oh dear, then it's, it's a very brief outlook. So, um, we recently started to, to try and modulate uh, the electronic interactions in, uh, in correlated materials. We started out with, with VO2. Uh, and the idea is really, uh, can we set uh, through the interaction with the, with, with the light, um, the, the initial, initial stage and then um, use what's happening later on to reach these uh, uh, kind of, um, uh, metastable states. Uh, so we started out by subgap excitation of vanadium dioxide. So we needed to use terahertz excitation. Uh, and the idea was, or the, the summary of this, of this, this, this paper is shown here. Uh, so initially the terahertz uh, pulse uh, uh, excites uh, uh, duplons and holons through Sina tunneling. And then after the, so this happens, uh, during the, during the pulse and lots of dynamics uh, that leads to that uh, is actually hidden by the pulse length. So we cannot actually resolve the dynamics, but what we can resolve here is the hopping that increases the, 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 the metallic regions in this insulating hose afterwards. So we clearly have to do a different experiment that shortens the, uh, that shortens the time resolution or improves the time resolution. So terahertz is actually not the right, right tool for that. So I'm briefly going to, to highlight some, some results we, we did for nickel oxide. Yesterday we heard a nice talk that uh, this can be studied also with high harmonic generation. This is a complex uh, 
figure I, I took from our collaborators. Uh, they measured the high harmonics in nickel oxide. And we had a, uh, an, an XFEL experiment uh, by actually probing um, with X-ray absorption what, what, what's going on um, at the respective absorption edges, like the oxygen and uh, the nickel. So here the uh, excitation was tailored such that it is sub, sub band gap and that it's away from any uh, e even dipole forbidden DD excitations. So we really don't excite uh, the material uh, resonantly. And then there is, uh, yeah, here um, for the oxygen edge. So this, these are time delay traces at, at certain, certain photon energies before the main absorption line. Initially, there's a transient feature at time zero when pump and probe is in overlap. And for the oxygen edge, not so much for the nickel edge. And in both cases, something remains um, at the end after, after the, the driving pulse is gone. And I'm just going to, to flash up a, a calculation from uh, Oscar, who will uh, show this in more detail tomorrow. So the movie should actually... Uh, So this should actually play a movie. Um, that doesn't seem to work. So I'm... No, it's working, working, working. It is? Yes. Oh, yes, there, there. It's on my screen, it isn't. <laughs> okay, so you, you can see that uh, the spectral uh, distribution varies and... Uh, looks. And you can also see that some features are introduced here in the band gap that we pick up experimentally. Um, again, uh, I'll just refer to, to Oscar's talk tomorrow uh, to give you more details. And I think this is a, is a really nice uh, uh, outlook for, for future work that uh, theory and experiment should, should go into um, during this project. So most of the stuff I've talked about was, was published. This one isn't. So I'll just flash up the collaborators and um, leave it up there. And thanks for your attention.